Somebody else? Here. I'm here. All right, we'll call the time board of commissioners to order, please. Uh, call to order. Can we have a roll call, Melissa? Yes, sir. Um, Mayor Owens. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Selby. Commissioner Borland. Here. Commissioner Collins. Here. Commissioner Mann. Commissioner Stetson. Here. Commissioner Wickstrom. Here. All right, we have a quorum. We'll proceed. Can we have adoption of the agenda? I move to adopt the agenda as presented. Second. All right, the motion is second to adopt the agenda as presented. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Uh, okay, Melissa, your show. Yes, sir. So item 3A on your agenda is a proclamation for National Safe Boating Week. Um, and I will read this proclamation and then once you all um, do your adoption, I'll present it to Barry. Whereas for millions of Americans, boating continues to be a popular recreational activity. From coast to coast, people enjoy time together boating, sailing, paddling, and fishing. And whereas during the National Safe Boating Week, the United States Coast Guard and its federal, state, and local boating partners encourage all boaters to explore and enjoy America's beautiful waters responsibly. And whereas on average 650 people die in boating-related accidents in the U.S., 75% of these fatalities are caused by drowning. And whereas the vast majority of these accidents are caused by human error or poor judgment and not by the boat, equipment, or environmental factors. And whereas a significant number of boaters who lose their lives by drowning each year would be alive today if they had worn their life jackets. And whereas National Safe Boating Week is observed, is observed to bring attention to important life-saving tips for recreational boaters so that they can have a safer, fun experience out on the water throughout the year. Now therefore, Mayor Bobby Owens and the Board of Commissioners for the Town of Manio do hereby proclaim May 21st through 27th, 2022 as National Safe Boating Week in the Town of Manio, North Carolina, and urge all of those who practice safe boating habits and wear a life jacket at all times while boating. This, the 18th day of May, 2022. Go ahead and proceed on this one. Get it over. With. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion on uh, Proclamation A? Any, any, any members want anything to say? All right. Uh, motions in order. I move to adopt the National Safe Boating Week Proclamation. I'll second it. All right. Motion seconded that the proclamation. Uh, be declared May 21st, 27th, National Safe Boating Week. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Okay, I'm going to do a quick pre presentation to Barry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Mr. Mayor, item 3B on the agenda is another proclamation, and this proclamation is support of a Wright Brothers Tribute Museum and Observatory Proclamation. This is a resolution in support of the Wright Brothers Tribute Museum and Observatory, whereas Orville and Wilbur Wright are credited with launching, launching the aerial age on December 17, 1903 by flying the world's first successful motor-operated airplane. And whereas the town of Manio enthusiastically agrees with establishing a tribute museum and observatory to the Wright brothers to help educate the world about aviation and the 12 seconds that changed the world. And whereas it is envisioned that the proposed Three, or I'm sorry, 30,000 plus square foot museum and observatory will house the largest display housing 12 historically accurate Wright Brother aircrafts, STEM training classrooms, a multi-purpose theater, 
an aircraft building workshop, an outdoor performance area, elegant cafe, gift shop, an extensive library and archive, the world-class observatory will appeal to visitors eager for family-friendly entertainment and education. In the mission control room, guests will be able to fly one of the four Wright Flyer simulators. Children will love the dual airplane launchers, paper rocket launchers, and dressing up in period costumes for souvenir picture. There will be parking for visitors, school and tour buses, and electric vehicle charging stations. And whereas this multi-million dollar project will be fully funded through private investors that want to make this vision a reality, completed and operated at no additional cost to taxpayers. And whereas it is thought the ideal location for this museum, observatory, and newly designed welcome center is on state-owned land where the Acock Brown Welcome Center and the Monument to a Century of Flight is located in Kitty Hawk. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Mayor Bobby Owens and the Board of Commissioners for the Town of Manio request that the State of North Carolina accept this gift of vision from Ken Hyde of Wright Experience and Bill Cress of Access Aerospace LLC and other private donors to establish the Wright Brothers Tribute Museum and Observatory on state-owned land at 5230 North Croatan Highway. This says Mania, but I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be in Kitty Hawk, or Kitty Hawk. Um, North Carolina, this the 18th day of May, 2022. Same, uh, any commissioners have any comments or questions or things about the proclamation? B, right, brothers? Sal, you're the uh, expert on this one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll move to support the Wright Brothers Tribute Museum and Observatory Proclamation. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. We support the Wright Brothers Tribute Museum uh, Proclamation. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes <clears throat> have it. Motion carries. Okay. Okay. Item 4A on your agenda this evening is department head reports. And um, I will note that um, Michelle is at the Main Street Conference, um, so she is not with us tonight. Um, and Heather had a, a vacation planned before she came to work for this week for, for the town, so she is not here this evening. Um, and the chief is away, but we've got Lieutenant Eilert here to fill in for the chief tonight. So Well, I'm certainly glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always here, Mr. Bobby. <laughs> um, so we'll go ahead and get that kicked off. start off in the department head report for the police department. I am Lieutenant Eilert. I'm here for uh, Chief Haskett today and I'll present you the department head report. Uh, our department head report is uh, we've been active in some training. It's during off season so we get a chance to send some folks away. Um, our training budget is, is rather hefty but it's needed. Uh, law enforcement has changed with the reforms and everything else. Uh, Chief Haskett, he attended the JCPC meeting. That's the juvenile council our juvenile uh, uh, criminal uh, protection council, so it's it's to reduce uh, juvenile crime. Uh, it, they have meetings just about every month to make sure that uh, they're addressing the juvenile issues within uh, not just not just uh, Dare County, but in all the jurisdictions here in Dare County, but along in the state. So make sure that we're updated on the juvenile uh, council meetings there. He attended the, uh, the Community Police Advisory Board meeting. Um, myself and him at attend every meeting there to make sure that we're uh, on pace. We have some, uh, some planned uh, stuff down at the marketplace, Manio Market, and uh, throughout the town. Uh, Dare, Dare Days is coming up, so we've made some, some uh, assignments there uh, on, at every event for every day. So we're working on that and future events throughout uh, the town. Uh, we had the Dare Days event. Myself and Chief Haskett attended that. That was a briefing at COA. Uh, we talked about the, the events that are going to be going on there as far as uh, police 
and security are concerned at COA to make sure that everything is good to go there. Uh, the Manio Pres uh, Preservation Trust meeting, he attended that, and then he completed his domestic violence training, Lynx audit. North Carolina Lynx is an investigative tool that we use, and we have to we get audited for that to make sure that we're following the proper policies in order to obtain um, investigative tools and information. It's all protected information, so you have to have a reason to run it, and that audit makes sure that we're following the, the proper rules of that Lynx audit. Uh, eth the ethics preempting misconduct and increasing integrity, that, that is a mandated uh, North Carolina uh, in-service class that we all have to take. Uh, it's a two-hour class, and he completed that uh, this in April. Um, there you have uh, my stuff um, listed as well as, as far as uh, Investigator Corbin and, and uh, Investigator Moore. Switch to the next one. Investigator Moore attended the Police Law Institute. That is an 80-hour course that's required to complete a criminal investigator certificate program. Uh, so he's well on his way to complete that. He should complete that within the next 12 months, uh, which will make every investigator, as far as the town of Manio is concerned, will have an investigator certificate, myself included. Um, investigator Corbin, he attended the uh, Integrated Communications Assessment and Tactics, that's, that's called ICAT. That is brand new. Um, it came about and from a, uh, the Police uh, Executive um, Research Forum. It came about in 2006 or 2016 uh, as far as um, use of force reform. So that came about, they did a study, they did some pilot uh, activities through 2016. They ended up doing six pilot agencies. The closest one to us was Prince William County, Virginia. Uh, they finished that and now they are, have implicated that throughout North Carolina. Currituck and, and College of the Albemarle there in Currituck were graciously uh, hosted us for a train the trainer. So two of our officers attended that so we can take part in that training. Uh, it's, uh, it, it has a lot with de-escalation. It has a lot with um, anything that involves PTSD, mental health, and uh, any violent um, assessments that don't include firearms. So if it's a chance to talk somebody down where there's not a firearm involved, that's what kind of training this is. So uh, it'll definitely help in de-escalation and use of force. Um, he's, he assisted in the COA uh, ribbon cutting along with Investigator Moore. They, we didn't have any issues with that. They needed to assist with some traffic going in and out. But other than that, there was no, no uh, issues to report there. Officer Land and several other officers have completed uh, in-service firearms. I think the only one that have not done in-service firearms are myself and the chief, and ours will get done in the fall. Uh, Officer Deaton, he also went to the, uh, the ICAT training there, but to note on his training is the advanced traffic crash training at, at NCJA Salemburg. Uh, that is a um, advanced training class for a traffic certificate. So there are several steps in, in uh, investigating traffic crashes. You have intro to traffic crash, which is just basic. And then you have what's called advanced traffic crash was a lot of math and formulas. So you make sure you, you're able to do the math that's involved with uh, coming up with speeds and, and uh, actions during crashes. And then that's what he had. He had two straight weeks of nothing but math. So he was a little bit stressed out when he got back, but it's a tough course, but he's completed it. And he wants to uh, be able to, to go to traffic reconstruction, which this is a requirement and a prerequisite for that class. So he will attend that uh, before the end of this year. Uh, officer Lassen, uh, our newest officer, he's been to in-service training. Uh, he helped out with security for an event at Pirates Cove, and he also worked uh, security for the concert at Roanoke Island Festival Park, which went off without a hitch. Uh, and we have several other events that are planned uh, throughout the rest of this month and the summer. Officer Grogan, uh, he's also done his firearms training and helped out with the COA ribbon cutting. And uh, now we come to our criminal and traffic report. We had six crashes during the month of April, five arrests. We issued 40 citations. Uh, most of those citations are speeding citations. Uh, we're still having several issues with uh, certain locations that were identified. We've identified in the traffic plan. We're still focusing on areas and we're still having problems with speeding. Uh, 64 has been a major hit for us uh, between uh, the Midway intersection and Pirates Cove. We've issued several citations there. 
Uh, most of our citations are issued for 15 miles an hour plus over the speed limit, so we still have an issue there. Uh, Fernando, uh, Bowser Town, um, Sir Walter Raleigh, we're still having a few issues there. Uh, we haven't issued uh, too many citations here on Upper Walk. I don't know if the new construction has kind of slowed things down over there, but we, uh, we haven't been issuing a whole lot of citations there. The rest of the areas is still hot and heavy. Ordinance violations and investigations, we've conducted 14 investigations. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, issues with property damage to town property uh, down on the waterfront. Uh, that's not an uncommon trend as far as the bathrooms are concerned. It seems to be a TikTok issue uh, that has come up. Uh, I know Killable Hills has had several issues with their um, bathrooms being vandalized and we are, are not, uh, we're, we're involved in it too, not just uh, Kittlewood Hills, but it seems to be a, a thing that focuses with juveniles in the middle school and high school that are on this TikTok phase. Um, the, we've had Cartwright Park was broken into recently. The bathrooms kicked in. We've identified some suspects in that through further investigation, and that, that may be part of the, uh, the craze with the, the juvenile stuff. Ordinance violations, we issued a couple of those. Uh, parking violations, warning tickets, we wrote 21 warning tickets with, uh, for any kind of traffic violation. Uh, as far as calls for service for the town, uh, once again, our little mighty police department, Nine Sworn, had more agency total call volume than any other jurisdiction in the town, or any, any other jurisdiction in the county. So we do very well with self-initiated calls. We had 1,836 self-initiated calls, 135 dispatch calls, for a total of 1,971 calls for service. So our guys are busy, very busy doing business checks, out talking with the community, and a whole lot of self-initiated calls. The guys, the guys are very good at that, getting out, talking to the public. Uh, we've received some, uh, some calls from the, from the uh, citizens and the public that they, they love our cops. They love our, our patrol officers and the fact that they get out and talk to them and they're, they're people. So can, we can relate. But that is all I have for the uh, police department. Any questions? Any questions for the lieutenant? Thank you. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you. I'll have a wonderful day. You too. Good evening, Josh O'Brien, Water and Sewer Department. Uh, starting with the service installations and operations billing snapshot for the month of April, as I like to do. Uh, numbers that pop out to me are that for once we actually installed a sewer tap and a water tap in the same month, which usually it's lopsided where we'll get two and or none. Um, of course, being a small town, we know there's not a lot of new construction um, monthly, so that was a, a fun exercise for staff. The monthly reread percentage for the month of April mostly issued by billing for high consumption. And again, that's done by Kim up front uh, to be proactive, to get out in front of any potential issues to make sure uh, if she sees any high numbers on readings that we get, she'll issue a work order to we can go out and check the equipment, uh, check with customers, look against readings. We can you know check against five gallon bucket, make sure there's no leaks to give the customers a heads up before just sending them out to, uh, to bill. So. Kim has always done a, a great job um, on that end. She's, she does that all by herself. So usually that's a stack of papers going through and really being proactive. So uh, she does really good with that. And by doing that, you know, the number was still really low at 1.7% of the meters for monthly meters. For quarterly rereads, the percentage was at 2.5%. And again, that's out of around 850 meters for our quarterly customers. Um, the only reason that is a little bit higher is just those meters, you know, we read them only every three months. Um, but the technology seems to be functioning well. I know I've prepped the board that uh, we're coming up on the, the, the point where we're having a few more, you know, meter replacements due to batteries and such. So we've still seen those numbers, although not on quite as large a scale as I thought going into this year's budget, so that's good. Although we did ask the board in this upcoming budget to, uh, keep the same number for next year just in case. I mean, there will come a time. Um, at the wastewater treatment plant, uh, we had a contracted replacement of a 30-year-old mud valve on Clarifier 2 wasting well, uh, which in order to replace the valve at the bottom of the tank, we had to drain the tank, which is roughly 100,000 gallons. 
uh, clean the clarifier, um, knocking out our annual tank cleaning for clarifier two at the same time. And for once, I don't have any pictures to show. I think this is the first meeting in my time as director. Uh, I don't have pictures, so instead, I figured I'd hit you with a bunch of numbers and words um, <laughs> that you probably can't read because I can't read them. So. But the idea with this was instead of going through slide by slide on nine separate slides and going through every single little thing that we've done each month, um, I wanted to highlight that outside of that snapshot that I provide on the previous slide monthly, um, we also have our computerized maintenance management system software uh, that we use as public works use it as well, and planning department, IT department too, uh, that we pay for, which is a great program. I like to brag on it. You know, I've talked about it in past meetings, but it allows us to issue work orders where our staff can have them on smart devices, on smartphones. It's all cloud-based, so we can issue work orders, manage work orders on our computers, you know, or the phones. Uh, but what this is is just nine snapshots to basically show you that in the month of April, every single one of those teeny lines represent a work order generated for preventive maintenance and or reactive maintenance, which is outside the billing work orders that are issued up here based on customer calls. Um, or the work orders issued through our 811 ticket software that Johnny Lee mostly handles um, for our locates and those averaging about 40, you know, 40 or so per month that he has to locate on those. So on top of these other type of work orders, and I always say preventive maintenance, you know, these are type of work orders that we're talking about scrubbing weirs up at the wastewater treatment plant, uh, in, inspecting pump station wells and pump station pumps and control panels, basic uh, housekeeping at the pump stations at the plant, basic yard maintenance, um, greasing bearings up at the plant, uh, we have a lot of motors, we have a lot of bearings, we have pumps, all these different mechanical aspects up at the plant uh, that all come with books, that all come with PM schedules, whether they're daily PM, weekly, and so on, going down that fun chain of preventive maintenance. So these are all the preventive maintenance, all the reactive maintenance work orders just for the month of April for the water and sewer department for mostly the pump stations, but really mostly the wastewater treatment plant. So this is what it takes outside um, you know, of our billing work orders you know, to keep a water and sewer utility of our size with the wastewater treatment plant running. Um, so I figured I'd just pull a few numbers from that without, like I said, going through a PowerPoint to where we're looking at you know, 12 different work orders for oxidation, ditch bearings, and greasing, and pulling temperature readings with temp guns, and so on. So in all, we had 180 preventive and reactive maintenance work orders issued in April, of course, preventive as in we are scheduling these, you know, in advance to try to prevent any damage, reactive, of course, if, you know, we uh, get an alarm call on a pump or, you know, open a control cabinet and there's smoke, just the type of stuff that we want to try to prevent. So out of the 180 for the month of April, that's an average of nine preventive and reactive work orders issued to staff outside billing and the 811 tickets. Um, to highlight some of the preventive maintenance scheduled tasks, in all, there were 44 pump station inspections in April, 28 weirs scrubbed by hand, 48 splash shields sprayed, 24 bearings greased, and that's not counting the 328 water quality samples that we collected. So if there are no questions, that's all I have. I, I got a question. On yes, April sir. 11th, uh, you had that uh, low pH result. Did y'all find out what caused that? It was, we've been hugging the lower end of the allow limit of 6.8 to 8.5 up there at the plant. We've known about this issue for some time and been working um, with engineers to replace our caustic tank. The caustic tank is inoperable currently and has been for the last few years, so that's why it has been on the budget. We have budgeted money to replace the caustic tank. Um, of course, that caustic tank was designed 30 years ago, and the material inside is partially frozen, um, pure caustic, and it just won't pump. So we've already, you know, gone through the engineering side of it, um, had some assistance on that, and are currently getting in numbers just to get a temporary fix to set up a smaller tank that's a little bit better for our, applica for our application. Um, so that's 
the reason why it was, I can't say the exact reason why pH dipped, you know, the nature of wastewater, um, unfortunately, P low pH is a, is a danger, that's why we have that caustic feed, but I have full confidence that we'll have a temporary solution um, on the caustic feed here shortly, um, and then of course, you know, with the, the bigger projects that, that we're working on too, with the, the copper reduction along with the, the UV light disinfection up there, um, pH is also relative to our chemical feed system. So, you know, if there's any purge in that chlorine or in the chemical we use to remove the chlorine, which is sodium bisulfite, sodium bisulfite, that dechlorination chemical by nature lowers pH. So that may have been what did it. Um, but again, we are right, we are literally uh, 0.1 below our limit on there. So, um, but we are definitely going to get that fixed as soon as possible. Thank you. Yes, and sir. I'll add, um, Commissioner Collins, we have been working. W in March, um, we received a letter from the state. They approved a, another water quality loan um, to do one of the projects on um, Josh's action item list, which is, it, well, it's, it, it's multiple things, but it's um, a UV disinfection system. And so the state has approved us for a loan for that. Um, I've been in contact with them um, since last week, and they are helping me work through the process of all the necessary approvals that you all need to do. Um, and then uh, Green Engineering will be assisting us on that. They were, they were the response to our request for qualifications, and um, I'm expecting to have a proposed contract from them next week. So that should be, if everything, if all the stars align the right way, I should have something for you all to approve um, for us to enter into an agreement with Green Engineering on that UV disinfection um, loan project um, at your next meeting. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Josh, let me ask you a question. Uh, how old is our system? <laughs> Uh, now, I, I, I know how old I am, and I know when it was <laughs> built, but I don't remember the year. Yes, sir. If we're talking about um, the drinking water distribution system and the sewer collection system, it was built in the 1940s. So, 40s. Yes, sir. We have the oldest water distribution yeah. system in Dare County. Yeah. So the plant right. was... Here's where I'm going. Sooner or later, we've been patching, repairing, fixing up, as Daryl alluded to, uh, we got to think about the future. We're all going to move out of here because we're so small and so compact, and it all depends on our system. And Job should, and his crew is doing an excellent job. But we're going to have to start thinking down the road uh, in a progressive mode, not a regressive mode, and what we need to do and what we should do. Just a thought. I'll leave it right there. Thank you, Josh. Yes, sir. Good evening, Frankie Willie, Public Works Director. Um, for the month of April, we installed new landscape timbers in front of the trees along Queen Elizabeth in front of the condos. Um, we assisted Barry at the Maritime Museum with cleaning the rain gauge in the weather station. We placed and anchored a new storage shed at the Public Works Complex and trim hedges within the town and the town facilities and continue picking up along the causeway. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Okay, so for the planning department, um, Woody uh, graciously went and took some pictures today of our two projects that we've been tracking. Um, the Davis lot, um, which is looking pretty sharp, um, and then the town common bathroom is just cruising along um, in its construction. Um, and I am so happy to tell you all, as I did in my email last night, that we do have a new pl town planner. Um, he is teleworking from his home in Virginia currently um, and will arrive in town um, the first week of June. It's like the Monday is June 6th. So Matt Farmer is his name. Um, he has 15 years of planning experience. Um, he is thrilled to be relocating here, um, and so we're real excited to have him. So um, currently, if you dial the planner's extension, 
um, it gets forwarded to a cell phone. So he's plugged in all day, every day. He's been reviewing all old meeting videos so he can just get up to speed. Um, and he has really hit the ground running, so that's super exciting. Um, the planning board um, at their meeting last week reviewed the draft comprehensive plan, um, and they have made um, some notes of corrections that need to be made to the plan. So I'm going back and forth with our consultant, Stuart Inc., um, on getting those um, items uh, corrected. So um, they have made a recommendation to you all of approval. Um, and we're just gonna work through the process. You may recall from the land use plan proposed amendment from last year, the public comment period, the public notice period for a CAMA land use plan is much longer than what our ordinance requires. So um, we, are, we are working through that process, but it won't actually be to you all um, for consideration of adoption until I think it's your July 6th meeting. So. Um, I do have a few copies if y'all want to see them. I can also give you a, a list of the edits that have been noted by the planning board members. I'm just tracking them in an Excel sheet. Um, but that is, um, that is good news that, that that process is coming to a close shortly. So um, that's all I have from the planning department. Good afternoon, Barry Wicker, Waterfront Operations. On the museum side, we, we're just continuing to get things ready for the summer. We've got all of our power boats that have been serviced in the last couple of weeks. Got the shed boat ready to go in the water. It'll go in the water right after dare days. And doing some deck repairs. Um, we're gonna do, coming back to my sailing program, because I say I always like to mention that, which starts on June 13th. One of my volunteers is a um, engineering kind of math type teacher was in the old days. So we're going to do some little STEM training, which is science, engineering, technology, and math kind of stuff. So we're going to do a little 20 minute um, with each class on where the wind comes from. So we've got like rain gauge and we got some different kind of stuff that the kids can get some hands on kind of to see how kind of the weather goes. So that'll be kind of a neat little addition to our sailing program. On the marina side, the marina continues to be busy. Uh, we had 27 boats visited last month. They're still staying one or two days. A lot of them extend over then, over also. Um, and we had a new, one new boat on our annual, um, for an annual voter, and about $3,000 worth of annual revenue. So on the annual side, we're pretty much booked up. So pretty much all of our annual slips are full. And couple weeks already, first two weeks of June, we're booked up on the transient side. So things are looking good on the marina side. Other than that, that's all I have. Any questions? Thanks. Carl Woody, IT department. Uh, so last month's uh, cyber trading was, don't get catfished with a pH. Uh, Basically, there's a new Netflix documentary that came out that said that it's, I think it's called the Tinder Swindler, mm -hmm. where uh, a person pretends who they are, like a big, rich, and famous, but they're really not. So this video is basically based on that, where somebody called in saying they were a boss of somebody and befriended that one person, and then when the time came and they needed an emergency, they went and gave them their password to get into sensitive documents and so forth. So. The biggest thing here is who are they? Fully verify a person's identity, especially if they're asking for sensitive information. Second, keep an eye out because be cautious with any offers that are too good to be true. And I've said that multiple times, especially with emails coming in, get your free $100 gift card, you know. There's always a catch somewhere in there. And finally, watch for red flags. A huge red flag of catfishing scams is a sensitive request in an emergency situation. So they said, we need this information now for a presentation or whatever. And, you know, pairing a sensitive information request with an emergency is a common playbook for bad actors. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, next, uh, we installed a new kiosk at Roanoke Marsh's Lighthouse. There's a picture of it. But the interesting thing is on the next slides is the usage, you know, what are people clicking on? So the most popular is the virtual tour, which takes a virtual tour of the lighthouse. Um, 
The next one is the, the video that we have that's called Life on the Lighthouse. Um, and it goes down from there, but uh, for about a month, we've had over almost 3,400 clicks. You know, that's just people on there clicking and looking at it and watching it. Uh, the next is pretty interesting, you know, uh, button clicks by week of day. Thursday is a very popular day for some reason so far. So um, that's where we're getting a lot of our usage. And the last one is clicks by hour. So uh, from one, two, and three is pretty popular um, in that area in the afternoon. So a little bit of stats, <laughs> but uh, you know, seems to be a, you know pretty positive um, addition into the lighthouse. So, um, but that's all I got. Cool. Uh, very interesting. Uh, two things: Can you tell from your clicks estimate how many people? visit uh, the Marshall's Light Museum uh, during the day? Is there any way you can roughly tell? With this software, it's basically who has interacted with the kiosk. I mean, you so. said you had 3,000 plus clicks. And yeah. I was wondering if there's any way you could tell roughly how many people would visit. I can, I can dig into them a little bit more and see what we have. Um, That'd be interesting because uh, that, that's a lot of clicks too. It's very impressive. Yeah, I mean, because uh, your, your whole system that you're getting ready to install is very, pretty impressive too. When, when do you think everything will be in place? Uh, well, we're working on the um, Maritime Museum. So uh, we've got a couple of videos done. We're going to use a couple more I think hopefully within the next three. I'm not four, trying to pin you. No, no, no three to four weeks time. we'll have those videos done. So I'm hoping the Maritime Museum will be out, you know, don't hold me to this, but a month and a half-ish to get that one out. Um, we still got a lot of work on the the, um, the uh, um, P, P. Island Cookhouse one. So, um, but. I don't know of any other town in eastern North Carolina as a whole from 95 this way has any such system as this. It's gonna be great. Yeah, it's all neat stuff, you know, it's, it's yeah. pretty cool. And I'm, I'm learning a lot from it too, because I mean, just <laughs> finding out, you know, like, you know, I don't know what Manio did during World War II. Well, we're gonna have a video that's gonna tell us. So I do. Pretty, pretty <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all I have, any other questions? Right, thank you, any other questions from the board? Thanks. Okay, Mr. Mayor, that concludes department head reports for the evening. Um, item 4B is just um, a quick report that I thought I'd offer to you all about transportation, and this will just take me a few minutes to go through. Um, so transportation and traffic have been recurring topics recently as the town has um, reviewed proposed developments. Um, at the January 5th Board of Commissioners meeting, a request was made for the planning board to review the 2006 Roanoke Island transportation plan. The planning board reviewed that plan at their January 11th meeting. Um, and this plan noted 17 projects on the island. Um, eight of those projects were located in, in or nearby the town's planning jurisdiction. Um, and they were US Highway 64 improvements, NCDOT yard connector, Upawak Avenue extension, which has been completed, the Agona Street connector, which is um, part of that proposed project, is the traffic circle where uh, Keeper Etheridge is, um, a connection between Sir Walter Raleigh Street and Vickers Lane, um, Vista Lake Drive, Bowser Town Road connection, <coughs> Vickers Lane extension to California Lane, and Midway access realignment. Um, so I'd note for you all that that 2006 Roanoke Island transportation plan was adopted by the town, but it was never adopted by the county. Um, and the planning board, um, one of the things that is noted um, on, the, on the highway is um, suggesting that the, the signals be timed and coordinated um, and that was one question that we, we weren't sure if that had ever happened or not, but it seems to make sense that, that they are linked um, together to keep traffic flowing. Um, and it was noted that the roundabouts um, called for in the plan were not constructed and 
Um, I recall that there was there was some opposition to that, so that may perhaps be why they, they weren't constructed. And of course, the Upper Walk Avenue extension was completed. Um, so this conversation got me thinking about um, general um, transportation topics. Um, and so I, I did some research and I wanted to share it with you all um, just so that um, we, we are all on the same page with our understanding about how these projects come to fruition. So um, the funding process for those um, projects have, have not been listed on the priority list that is produced by the Albemarle Regional um, Planning Organization. Uh, typically for the town of Manio, the town manager participates in the Regional Technical Coordinating Committee or RTCC and we have a designee from the town board of commissioners who sits on the Regional Transportation Advisory Committee or RTAC. Um, I have attended these meetings as the town planner when I first started and then I've, in April I attended the April meeting as the town manager. Um, so I've begun to attend these meetings again. Um, slide three, this slide is just a breakdown um, of how um, transportation projects are funded. Um, so when you take the whole pie, 40% of, 40% um, goes to statewide projects or the state transportation improvement plan. 30% um, goes to regional projects and another 30% goes to division projects. The statewide projects are identified in the State Transportation Improve Improvement Program that is adopted by the State Board of Transportation. The current STIP is for years 2020 through 2029. And it identifies transportation projects that will receive funding between 2020 and 2029 is made up of 1,718 projects, including 399 non-highway projects in every county across the state. So this is a map of those projects statewide. And then the next slide, I zoomed in on their county um, so you can see those, those larger projects. These are the big dollar projects. So back to the APRO, this graphic shows how these groups work together the, the Transportation Advisory Committee, the Technical Coordinating Committee, DOT, Planning Agency, and then the RPO kind of brings them all together. The next slide is an organizational chart that continues that explanation. And we'll get back to it later, but you'll see at the bottom, I just wanna note, um, the transportation plan um, is part of this organizational chart. And as I mentioned, we'll get back to that. So at the APRO level, the, the way these meetings um, run is that the, the staff or um, the planning group meet and then typically in the middle, we hear from DOT, and then second, the, the body of elected officials gather and then meet after that, and they approve what, or deny, what has been recommended to them. Um, so part of the work that they do is they rank projects um, you know, for these regional and um, divisional projects. So um, the RTCC and DOT division rankings make up 50% of the scoring for the division projects for, yeah, and then 30% of the scoring for regional projects, and they do not have input on the statewide projects. Um, the project scores were approved last year at the April 21st RTAC meeting. Um, and so this is just a reminder of that breakdown of how all those pieces of the pie fit together. 
So the APRO also coordinates the local transportation plans. And so the Dare County Comprehensive Transportation Plan was complete, completed in 2015. Um, here's a little explanation from the APRO's website um, about coordinating those plans. And then the next slide is taken from the plan. It's a recommendation that the plan has that does state, which we all live every day, um, that US Highway 64 from Marshall Collins Drive or Midway Intersection um, to Mother Vineyard Road on Roanoke Island is currently over capacity. The stretch of facility goes through the town of Manio as well as Dare County, and it includes the intersection of US 64 and Marshall Collins Drive. Because of physical constraints, no method of improvement was found to be acceptable to Manio or Dare County at this time. Storefront development prevents any additions to the current pavement width. Other routes connecting the Outer Banks to the northern end of Roanoke Island were studied as part of this CTP. However, none proved <clears throat> to be feasible at this time. An intersection improvement plan is needed at 345 and 64 and US 64 bypass has been identified. Since any improvements that involve a grade separation is not preferred locally, that's like a flyover or other things that have been suggested in the past. No proposed improvement has been agreed upon. The steering committee would recommend that this intersection be for further study. Um, and, and there are, there are dollars. This is the, um, these are all the projects, and there's a second slide to this um, that are listed for Dare County. And I, this is not what the list looks like. I just cut and pasted the relevant columns out for you all. So if y'all want to see the list in its entirety, I can share it with you. Um, but you can see that um, there, it's the, the really expensive one is Wellbone. I think it's on the next page. Um, I thought it was around, anyway. I can clarify that for you, but there is um, there are dollars associated with the Midway intersection improvements in the improvement plan, um, and there. So this list that we have for Dare County, only three of the items are for Roanoke Island, and two of them are associated with the airport. Um, And of course, that, that plan is to recommend further study. Um, of course, we do have the ability to conduct our own projects on streets or roadways that we own um, by way of using our POW bill funds. Um, but otherwise, um, you know, when it comes to these, these challenges that we're having, we, we really need to, um, I think, advocate for what we need. <laughs> so um, that's kind of the 10,000 foot level. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. <clears throat> well, one thing, could I speak to you? Um, one thing I was thinking when you were presenting this is we really have to, we must know what it is that we do need before we, you know, before we advocate and um, put ourselves out there. So it seems to me that we need like a comprehensive um, look at and meetings uh, to get input from the public on, on what is doable and what people will support. So the APRO does that, and that's the plan that was done for Dare County in 2015. And, and what was noted for the island is midway intersection improvements. Um, I know that there is public participation in that process. I don't know how, I don't know when the next round happens for those, those plans. That was also seven years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And we've had development since then and we project even more development. So I think something more current might be helpful. Um, but it seems like there's so many disparate pieces that need to come together and an overall
comprehensive look, um, something we can get our arms around. We had talked a little bit about that. Um, so it, it looks like there are dollars to do um, that kind of research study. Well, the APRO, I mean, it's on a cycle, and we'll, what I need to find out now is ask them, you know, when is Dare County up again? And right. then, you know, the onus will be on us to participate. Right. Yeah, I, I think seven years with all that's happened here is too, is, uh, too long ago <coughs> to get a correct reflection. So, and, and so we don't know when the next round No, but we can find out. Okay. That would be a great first step, I think. Um, just so we're clear, the midway intersection improvements that you're referencing, does a roundabout fall into that category? That's why it hasn't happened mm. yet. It was, it was recommended there. And okay. then a flyover has been recommended. Um, there have been a number of alternative options that have been presented there. Um, and there, it, it has been, it has received funding in the plan, okay. um, and we, it's received high priority rankings. Um, could we see the, or at some point we'll see the alternatives that were suggested other than the roundabout? A flyover. Oh, the, oh okay, there was only those two. Okay. okay. Hmm. Well, the roundabout and the flyover both have been discussed many times in the past. I don't know what year the first it started. Uh, Daryl would know. I don't think he's part of the committee, but it was when uh, that group was here. You might have been part of it, Daryl. You remember writing about it in a uh, flyover? And it was quite controversial. Right. Quite controversial. And so that planning process began around 2004. Yeah, that's about, that's about right. Even earlier than that, I think. I don't know. Angel Corps and all of them were involved. That's in, right. Uh, but more than anything else, uh, cars coming from east to west, tourists, uh, they've been clock speeding at an average around 50 miles an hour down at the, uh, and I don't know what you're going to do about that, because uh, a father with two kids that want to go to the bathroom, he's coming from Raleigh, he's going to be in a hurry coming through there. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm not getting in that, but. Certainly, I agree with Sherry that we uh, uh, the local study. What caught my attention here, I was going to ask you, this is a run up the island study commission. This is not a many of a study commission. So are we, how much are we involved in this study commission? Well, so in 2004, the Roanoke Island Transportation Committee, which involved the corridor folks, the town, the county, um, that plan, which was the plan that yeah, the planning right. board reviewed with the 17 projects. Um, that group. Um, well, the corridor, as you know, no longer exists. I mean, that's well, the town problem. enforces those rules. Um, so I don't know what happened, but the town yeah, adopted that plan. You, point blank, could we institute our own so called manual transportation committee? I don't know. We could ask. I mean, because then it would put us in. <laughs> Amen. It would kind of just locate us as individuals of true need for Manny. I but think we, you... we, we can't get in, really, we can, we can voice an opinion, but then it can tell us to go jump in the lake. Uh, I'm talking about the county, and that, that's at Midway. Yeah, well, the problem with the Midway, too, is it's two DOT roads, so you're not going to have any say about it other than begging or asking that's, anyway. That's what I'm but saying. for the rest of the town um, maintained roads, you could, you could certainly put together a committee that provided you with advice about how to deal with them or, or uh, traffic thoughts. I, I see something myself that's going to have to be done almost immediately. And I just looked at it. We're going to have to have crosswalks at COA from... from from the shops across the road, mm -hmm. COA, a crosswalk with flashing lights, caution pedestrians cross. Mm -hmm. We don't have them. And that's going to be a need for, for these college students and people across the back and forth. But that, that's local. I mean, that's in time. We can handle that, I guess. Well, it's, it's still a DOT road. You're still going to. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you, I, I've seen it in other towns where 
sometimes they say yes, sometimes they say no. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the, um, it, it's all about uh, poking them in a way that gets them to say yes, I suppose, is, is, is the best way well, to say that. We need to continue looking at it. As Sherry said, if Sherry wants to suggest a committee or something later on, we can get move on in that. I'd like to suggest for Ruth Jane, I, I think she might know it, I don't know, but she lives on State Highway, so does Mr. Keeney. <laughs> the 400, one circle through time, the 400 starts down here and goes all the way around and comes out right here. And that is a State Highway. So, there we are. Uh, okay, let's move on. I want to make a couple. Go just, ahead. Yeah, you know, there's, there's some that we can't control, right? There's not, these roads aren't manios. Um, and there's a lot of politicking involved that you can see just by peeking at the organizational structure and all that. I think to your point, whenever that next meeting comes around, whether it's next year or in three They meet years, quarterly. Well, the, um, the one from 2015. Oh. So whenever that, you know, if Mania was not ready to have their list and study done to be proactive, there's no way we're getting a dime to do anything. Um, and so I think that is a good idea to be figuring out what Manio, what Manio needs. And then the other thing, what can we control? And, and Ruth, you talked about this when we were talking with the county too. I mean, traffic is a good problem to have, unfortunately. And, um, you know, we can try to do things like crosswalks and sidewalks and, and make sure that Manio is a nice, clean, walkable town and, uh, um, and make sure it's safe and accessible and, and easy to not be in your car. Um, you know, just, just two thoughts on that. So do we have, I mean, if we were to try to figure this out sooner rather than later, are, do we have funds, whether it's our funds or the pot of money that you're talking about, um, that we could have some uh, expert views, I mean, engineers help us because I, most people who would serve on a committee, I would think, wouldn't necessarily have that expertise. So that would be something that we'd absolutely require, I would think, um, in order to do something that the state, that the county and the state would say, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Sure, and, and we have some professional services, professional services. dollars allocated um, in the recommended, in the, in the recommended budget um, that, I have no idea what that would cost, but we've got, maybe, we, maybe we've got some money to get that started or maybe we could find some grant dollars. That would be my preference, mm -hmm. um, to, to maybe find a grant that we could go after that would help us with that. That's a big project. Yeah, it's it is. a big project. Well, just to uh, do something quickly for our citizens, I think the crosswalks, I've heard that come up, um, especially when talking to the neighborhood Oak, I always want to call them Creek View, but that's by the high school. Oh, Cypress Cove. Cove, thank you. Miss Ann lives back there. She's the first one I talked to about it. I saw that DOT has just, I've been following grants like crazy, like a hawk. I saw they just have a discretionary safe road grant that is, has come up, is open now for applications. Crosswalks and flashing lights could fall under that, so maybe there is some kind of due diligence or even small movements forward in traffic and safety that we could do uh, would make our citizens happy. Go ahead, Mary. No, I'm just going to say I agree with you, Ruth Jane. I think they're doable that, because it's not unreasonable and certainly pedestrian friendly and as Jason alluded to, we, that's one thing we can do is protect our citizens and make uh, crosswalks and things like that and crossovers uh, pedestrian safe. And that's an issue that hardly anybody can turn down if we can prove the point. Mm -hmm. Yes, prove sir. the point more than anything else. Uh, dreams and expectations are totally two different things. And uh, what we can ask for and what we think we can get, we can. And, Dreams are just in another world that they poof away so fast. There's a lot of restrictions on crosswalks because we put a crosswalk at the, the top lot on, <coughs> on uh, Sir Walter Raleigh by Cook House. And the next day, the DOT came and burned it off. Oh, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> See, and, and he's right. That's what you, 
you wouldn't believe. Uh, I tell you, this is sad, and you're part of it too, and you might be part responsible for it. In the old days, the air tank could get anything it wanted. It was called the Bass Night Highway. Mm -hmm. And we got a lot of things out of Bass Night, four lanes and shorter routes to Raleigh and Greensboro and everything. And, He's no longer here now, so we're going to have to fight for everything we've got. And they laugh at us now, truthfully. Mm. We'll pray for help. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Sharon, what do you want to do with your problem? I mean, do you want to pursue, stay, take a little while and think about it or what? Right. I think um, you've got a good idea about a committee. Uh, right. And uh, Darryl, I don't know if you were suggesting a committee or not, to tell you the truth. Uh -huh. I, I'm not trying to get in your head. Right, right. I think I think a committee would be a reasonable thing. It would certainly help us get some um, resident input too, and yeah. um, you know, make a connection there. Daryl and I have talked about um, how we. I mean, Daryl is our is our designated person, um, and so for the two committees, the planning um, committees, Melissa, what are the acronyms? Well, the APRO is kind of the umbrella of both of them. Yeah. And so, but Daryl and I were hoping that we could, Daryl, if I'm speaking out of no, turn, no, please no, let we, me we know. About but um, that we could sort of piggyback with each other. Um, and so if they're, so that we could always have some representation. And I think having two people, it's a big topic. Mm -hmm. And having two folks makes sense. It made yeah. sense to both of us that we could work together um, as co representatives, I guess. Um, so I, I thought that would be a good place to start. I would like to get my feet wet first before we, um, um, before we go ahead and, and start this committee. I'll also figure out some of the, the questions. Where, would, where does the money come from for the engineers? What would this committee look like? I like to have param not parameters, but I, I like to have a plan. I'm a big planner. Um, <laughs> of how a thing, how this committee would work, what the responsibilities would be, um, who we could interface with um, on behalf of this group, those kinds of questions. But I personally would like to start out by understanding what this is first and work with Daryl. Ben, after listening to Sherry, what would be your suggestions at our turn? between having a committee or not having a committee? Well, evidently, Daryl represents us on committees, and I think Sherry's asking for another uh, committee to jointly work together, unless I'm wrong. A co-chair? Co co that's what I'm talking about, co-chair. Co that would, would that be in trouble? Well, no, I mean, you only appoint one person to be on the ARPO, but having that person have input from others or, or even developing a, a Mantio committee that gives uh, Commissioner Collins input and advice so that he can provide it to the ARPO. I, I don't think there's any legal reason not to do that. It's, you know, it's really up to you about how much you want to distribute your decision making. Is it something you want to decide and, 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 and provide to Commissioner Collins or is it something you want to delegate to a committee and let the committee provide? Um, and then I, I think the other consideration may be um, Commissioner Wickstrom's concept of having an engineer look at it versus having a committee of people who might have great ideas well, but not have the uh, mm -hmm. uh, expertise to really provide much um, um, driving information. I checked their bylaws the the uh, this morning, and um, it does appear that in times where our designee is unable to attend, he can designate someone in his stead. So mm -hmm. that is perfectly acceptable um, as per their bylaws. That would be great. Well, why don't we do this for a second time? You, you put, you, you, of course you would do it anyhow, you put an organization or something together that'll work and bring it to us next board meeting. I mean, from what you've heard tonight, and let us listen to you and see if it's acceptable or not, and can we move forward with it? Sure, and um, I'll get 
answers to some of the questions. And um, what I might do is uh, the county also has a representative who is very active on this board. So I may reach out to him and see how they share information about this, if they've got some best, best practices that we might be able to use too. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Listen, you'll handle that and we'll move on. Yes, sir. So the next item on your agenda is item five, public comment. Members of the public are invited to address the Board of Commissioners on any topic. Public comment is not intended to require the board to answer any impromptu questions or take any action on items brought up during this period. Speakers will address all comments to the board as a whole and not one individual. Discussions between speakers and members of the audience will not be allowed. Time limits are three minutes per person or five minutes per group. Please come forward to the lectern and identify yourself so your statements can be recorded. All right, would anyone like to be heard? Go ahead. Hi, I'm Jenna, um, and we had, we're working with you all on a lease for Betty's Corner, um, possibly with the um, pavilion or the Magnolia Market. Um, and I know we sent, we sent a simplified- Could you pull your microphone down a little bit? Okay. Maybe. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, could you hear me at all or yeah, should, okay. I can now. Okay, well I'm Jenna and um, I just wanted to see, we had sent a simple, another lease over to Melissa. I wanted to see if you guys had any questions for me or concerns that we could address. Um, and that's that, I don't know, that's all. So. Well, we, we can't answer, we can't respond to you at public comment period at all. That's standard procedure. Okay. We can't even really comment, tell you the truth, so we can just listen to you. If you have anything to say, you just okay. go ahead and say what you want to and okay. tell us your story, but we cannot respond. Okay. I didn't um, know if you knew this or not. <laughs> not really, but, um, you know, I was just here for that, and then, you know, just wanted to kind of say we're here and excited to kind of get that going. And, you know, we know the summer's here, so we're just waiting on that. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm awfully sorry and puts me in an awkward situation at the same time as, as it does the board. But uh, normally at uh, public comment period, we're not supposed to. We can if we want to, I think, because we can do what we want to. But traditionally, all boards, not just this one, any public comment period, we listen to the public. And if you want to call me ASOB, you're certainly welcome to. <laughs> <laughs> and I cannot, I cannot respond to you. So <laughs> now's your time. <laughs> Anyone else like to be heard? All right, Melissa. Okay, item number six is a public hearing um, for the recommended fiscal year 2022-2023 budget. Members of the public are invited to, to address the Board of Commissioners on the recommended fiscal year 2022-2023 budget. Comment is not intended to require the Board to answer any impromptu questions or take any action on items brought up during this period. Speakers will address all comments to the board as a whole, not one individual. Discussions between speakers and members of the audience will not be allowed. Time limits are three minutes per person or five minutes per group. Please come forward to the lectern and identify yourself so your statements can be recorded. Good evening, I'm Bob Keeney, 342 Fernando. And I'm glad I'm here this evening because I really enjoyed the previous discussion you had on transportation and traffic because that's, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the topics I'm gonna have if my voice and the um, allergies I'm having are, can survive. But, but on, the, on the budget itself, um, I had submitted to you, I think a, a month or so ago, something like that, about three, three issues that I would like to see identified. Uh, one of those was the traffic radar devices that I thought would be helpful to have those to reduce some of the uh, speeding that's going on in, in the town, and I think everybody knows that that is occurring. Um, it, is, it did not show up in the budget, but I, I would hope that uh, funds could be maybe made available this year, if not this year, next year for, for purchase of some of those devices. I think it would be worthwhile while doing that. 
The other is the um, street intersections, and this goes to what you were just talking about. There are many intersections in this town that really need four-way stops. Several years ago, those of us, I wasn't here at the time, but many of you were, uh, some of these intersections uh, were made four-way stops or three-way stops. Uh, DOT found out about it and uh, apparently came and said you can't do that and stop that uh, activity from happening. I think one of the problems at that time was that the, uh, the town said that these were put into place to reduce speed. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is not what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that the intersection is such that it's very difficult to see oncoming traffic and even people with bicycles and others uh, traveling along. So I would not, um, if, if, you work with the if you work with the state on this, I would suggest that it's, it's really the site uh, situation, not, not speeding that we're really dealing with here. Uh, that was not in the budget. It's not a big ticket item, but uh, I would suggest to be placed in the budget for a kind of a to-do list for the, for the coming year. And kind of a small ball item that uh, you were talking about, larger items like the uh, roundabout uh, in Midway. Um, this is a small ball item, which I think could probably be dealt with between uh, the board and, uh, and DOT representatives on that. By the way, I should say the roundabout. Uh, having spent some time in Florida, they have a lot of roundabouts in Florida. If those folks can handle roundabouts, <laughs> I think our folks here can certainly handle those quite easily. Uh, the other is the Manio Recreation Park. The COA is going to be taking over all of that land at some point, and I think the town really needs to work with the county and to identify what is needed and to identify uh, co probably county land, maybe some town land, that can be used in the future. Otherwise, it's going to be gone. Uh, we saw what happened uh, with the Bower Sox, Bower Sox, <laughs> Bowser Town uh, situation. Uh, it's now going to be uh, housing, which is fine, but that would have been a perfect location for a ballpark, uh, soccer field, uh, you know, football and the like, along with the, uh, the boat launch area on, on the side. So we lost that piece of property, but let's find out, let's identify something else that we can use in the future. And uh, that would probably, you'd probably need to have a needs assessment done, and that would be the costly part, working with our county uh, representatives. So that's all I have for this evening. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody else like to be heard at public hearing? Would anybody else like to be heard at public hearing on the bu uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, on the budget? All right, we'll close the public hearing. Clear most. Item 7A is um, new business on your agenda, and it is to set a public hearing for the 2022 Comprehensive Plan, CAMA Land Use Plan. And so as I mentioned in the department head report, um, because of the time that is required by CAMA um, for notification, and we've got to take the document over to the courthouse and all those things, um, Jamie worked up a schedule, and the best date to do that is July the 6th. So we would need a motion from you all to move forward. All right. Do we have to have a motion to set a public hearing? Uh, not always, but it's it's better since we're dealing with a well, state it'd be agency here to have if it. We do. Yeah, it's better. I move to set the public hearing for the 2022 comprehensive plan, Camel Land Use Plan for July 6, 2022. Second. All right, July the 5th? Six. 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 Okay. Did I say the 5th? No. Which, which day? Six. Six, okay. All right, there's a motion and second. We set a public hearing for the comprehensive use plan. Uh, uh, there is a motion and second for the hearing to be set for July the 6th. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carried. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, the next item on your agenda is a closed session for um, a number of items that are listed on the agenda. Um, I have crafted, 
what I hope is um, easy for you all, <laughs> the motion to go in with the assistance of the town attorney. Um, but the the appropriate motion is, oh, but he has a note. Yep. Uh, the, the motion that uh, uh, Melissa has provided you is appropriate except for one mistake that I made. I told her that it was okay to go into a closed session to talk about uh, the lease with regard to the uh, 408 Queen Elizabeth Avenue uh, under Section 5, and you cannot do that. Uh, I thought about I corrected myself just a little while ago and checked on the thing, but most of what we'll be covering about that was under the attorney-client privilege part anyway, so if you want to read the motion, I would just strike out the last part, the and 408 Queen Elizabeth Avenue Manio, and we'll, we'll cover the lease discussion under the uh, attorney-client privilege portion that you were going into as well. All right, we'll take the attorney's uh, suggestion. We'll let him make a motion and move from there. I'll, uh, is, that, is, that, is that the lease that it is. you see we're talking about? Okay. I, I would suggest that somebody would make a motion to go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11a Two, to prevent the premature disclosure of an honorary degree, scholarship, prize, or similar award. Section three, to consult with the town attorney in a manner preserving the attorney-client privilege. And section five, to establish or to instruct staff or negotiating agents concerning the position to be taken negotiating the price and or material terms of a contract or pro proposed contact, excuse me, or proposed contract for the acquisition of real property by purchase, option, exchange, or lease the real property located at 304 Sir Walter Raleigh Street, Mantia. Can somebody remember that motion? Uh, if you can, uh, go ahead and make so it. Move. <laughs> I, so, I just say so move. Yes. Okay. Second. Motion is second. We go in closed session in regards to. Uh, I can't repeat the motion. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. Now we're going to have a motion going closed session. That was it. That's what we just did. Well, that's it. Yep. Oh, that was it. Yes, sir. We've discussed it, so do we, we don't need a further discussion on that matter, do no. we? How do we need to close out of that thing in just, open session? Just make a motion to adjourn. Oh, well, you, oh. Do, you still do have mayor and commissioner comments oh, you on your agenda. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I want to get out of this thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, I didn't have my second sheet. Uh, I don't have any comments. It's been a good meeting. Uh, Ruth Jane, take off. Um, I just want to thank our awesome town for all the help they've given me lately in many projects that I've done. And I um, just want to praise God in all of his awesome glory and thank him for everything he does. Tell? I don't have anything right now. I don't have anything. Sherry? Just one quick, quick thing. I would like to give kudos to Melissa for her hirings in uh, finance and planning, especially her hirings of three different people during a time when you yourself are um, acclimating to a very new and complex position. So great leadership. Thank you. Thank you. That's excellent. Uh, Jason? I had plenty to say tonight, so I'm good. Nothing tonight. <laughs> well, I sure don't either, so we'll... Uh, I guess we'll adjourn now until uh, when? Your next meeting is June 1st. June, June At 6.30. 1st. All right, we'll... I move to we adjourn. Gotta, we got to have... Yeah, go ahead. Make I move to adjourn. Uh, All right. Do I need... Till June first, everything about six thirty. I second. All right, the motion <laughs> second. We adjourn to June the first uh, at six thirty. Uh, all in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. We stand adjourned. <laughs>